Why is this the best time to live on Earth ever? The dissolution of an old paradigm is happening right in front of us. And the birth of a new paradigm is happening. And we're at a stage of our development as a species where we can and we must participate in our own unfoldment, in the unfoldment of the species. We have infinite potential within us. And with spiritual practice and intentionality, we become who we already are. You are an instrument of infinite potential, exuding through your own soul. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, my that your cuteness. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to get in alignment with your soul, then do we have the Life Visioning Michael Bernard Beckwith show for you. Today I'll be talking with Michael Beckwith, famed speaker from The Secret, best-selling author and founder of the Agape Center, about how to become the alchemist of your life and get in alignment with your soul. That plus we'll talk about Homeless Methodist Church, Dr. Howard Washington Herman, Golden Hues of Possibility, The Law of Radiance, Becoming Metaphysicians, Fish and Climbing Trees, Martin Luther King and Soft Hands, and What in the World Scrolls Rolling Out of the Sky Have to Do with Anything. So welcome to the show, Michael. Are you ready to shine? Michael, thank you so much. I see by the introduction you just gave me, you did a little research on me. <laughs> oh, I had to have fun, Michael. I absolutely have to. So with that said, there's something you said recently that really caught my eye. Before we dive right into things, why is this the best time to live on Earth ever? This is the best time to live on Earth because the de- dissolution of an old paradigm is happening right in front of us. And the birth of a new paradigm is happening. And we're at a stage of our, our, our development as a species where we can and we must participate in our own unfoldment, in the unfoldment of the species. All of this is, we're in, a, we're in a powerful moment of intensity, which allows for our growth development unfoldment to happen more rapidly than any time in human history. This is a good day in every way. Thank you. So then why you, you used a very interesting, a loaded word there. We must, must participate. What does that mean to you? Basically, we're full to overflowing with, with infinite potential. The universe does not like wasted potential. So we, so we have a mandate to actually activate our potential. We are here not to merely live in survival. We're here to actually thrive with the activation of our potential for the period of time that we have a body. Now, there used to be an old theological perception that said that we were to be good until we die and then go to heaven. Now we know that that's an old, worn out theology that doesn't fit anymore with the teachings of, of mysticism and quantum reality. We're here with the body to bring that which we would call heaven to earth. Heaven is expanded good. Heaven is love. Heaven is intelligence. Heaven is kindness. Heaven is beauty. So we're letting go of the concept of waiting to go to heaven. And we're embracing that this time by which we have a body, we're to activate potential. So we must do this. We didn't come here just to accumulate a bunch of stuff, play the game of of getting stuff and then dying. We came to activate our potential have it be a part of our consciousness and take it with us anywhere that we go after that. Thank you. And this is this this is the good stuff. This is the exact, ooh, dare I say, opposite of the old school law of attraction. And so I'm wondering how either your ideas have changed or how much the world has changed since the time of the secret. Well, my when I was doing the secret, my ideas were pretty much the way it is now, that we were here to to radiate, to activate potential within us. And then the the, the linguistic convenience of that is the law of attraction. It it looks like we're attracting things to us. But that's just a linguistic convenience, uh, basically saying that whatever you're holding in awareness, you manifest, you bring it into visibility. It looks like attraction but it's really a radiance from the depth of your being. And then that radiance condenses itself as opportunities, potential possibilities, serendipity, coincidences, and ultimately manifestation. 
So I, I think the law of attraction just it catches a certain uh, uh, a basic understanding, that, but it's actually you are becoming something in consciousness. You're actually becoming a higher frequency, which then manifests as experiences in your life. Thank you. Will you talk about something called the law of luminosity? And here's what I'm understanding. We have this light within us. The light didn't, didn't even start with us. We're a fiber optic cable back to source. There is this light within us. When we start to, as you call it, activate our potential, that light starts to shine through. We become the harbinger. We become the wayfarer holding that lantern for everyone else around us. Absolutely. When we hear the words, we are the light, the light that lights up every man, every being, every individual, every woman, every them, every they that comes to the planet, the same light that was found in the avatars who have walked before us, that's not prose, that's not metaphor, that's not poetry. That's a description of our identity. We are luminous beings. We are that light. Now, last January, as an example, I was about to do a, a program such as I'm doing with you now. And I always meditate, of course, before I do anything. I'm sitting on my couch, meditating, getting prepared for the, for the class I'm about to teach. And when I opened my eyes, I was blind. I was blinded by the light. I couldn't see that the, the light was so bright that I could not see anything in front of me. So I called in a Reverend Kathleen McNamara, Lee Simon Brown, who you just met. And I said, I can't do the program right now. I can't see anything. I, it, it was just the brilliance, ecstasy, bliss. And, and then I, when I looked in the direction of Lee and I looked in the direction of Kathleen, I saw this fountain of light in them just cascading. And I realized once again, that that was their real identity. Their real identity was light. And they had a body, they had a mind, they had an astral body, they had subtle bodies, but their real, who, who they really were, who we really are is light. Now, the only thing about that particular experience was that I've had it before, but that particular one was the first time it ever happened publicly or when there was witnesses to it. Normally that happened at home, in my meditation, in my sleep, but that really confirmed again for me that when we say we are the light, we are luminous, it's not poetry, even though poems and songs have been written about it. It's really our real identity. And when we enter into spiritual practice in a whole soul devotional manner, that light, as you just said, we become more luminous. The, the, the luminosity of love and beauty and intelligence flows through us, and we do become a light unto the world. Thank you. I, I want to talk about our, our, our soul plan, being true to our soul, all of these things. But before I do that, it's very interesting what you said, because there's been a theme coming up since our question number one here, that in a sense, we have things backwards. First off, we think this is the worst time to be alive when it's the best time to be alive. Secondly, we think that we are less than and that we are anything but the light when our real identity is this incredible light and greatness, isn't it? Absolutely. And what has happened is that um, individuals have allowed their minds inadvertently, not on purpose, uh, to become hijacked by fear and worry and doubt and a deep sense of separation from source. And when the mind is hijacked that way, it can be inundated with all kinds of lies, and, but, but, and, a, and a lie acts as a law until it is neutralized. So that individuals whose mind has been hijacked, they develop a personal law of lack, a personal law of fear, anxiety, anxiousness, and they actually believe that's reality. No, that's just their experience of reality, but it is not reality. Reality is that this presence, by whatever name you choose to call it, is everywhere in its fullness. And that through our intentionality and spiritual practice, we begin to open up and see reality for real, not just a figment of reality, which are the thought forms that our mind has been hijacked by. It, it's interesting because to me, there is an energetic I'm going to go old school on us. An old school TV where you actually had to tune it in, Michael. There is a mistuning 
of information. You said the lie acts as a law until it's neutralized. It's about energy. To me, when I see somebody stuck in pain, in fear, in worry, and in anxiety, they have this tremendous amount of energy going through them. They just need to tune into the right channel to perceive it differently. When that lie is neutralized, you've got the same amount of energy, but now it's taking you where you want to go. Absolutely. And this is the the blessing and the bane of the human experience. You can change your mind. You can make up your mind. You can take, I like to say, you know, and my, my upcoming podcast is going to be called this title. I like to say you can actually take back your mind so that it's not hijacked by the lesser use of the law, and it's actually infused with possibility and potential and affirmation and love, but you have to take it back. You can't just walk lockstep in the, in the present paradigm. We didn't come here to do that. We came to shatter the paradigm so that our time on the planet is actually an adventure of shattering the present paradigm so that we as Humanity become greater and greater visions and versions of ourselves. Woohoo! What you're talking about is alchemy, spiritual alchemy, turning lead to gold, turning what we think is one thing into what it was always meant to be or truly is once we change our vision, isn't it? A- absolutely. You know, the, the, the master alchemist knew a couple of things. One of the things they knew is that in order to turn lead to gold, you had to have just a tiny bit of gold. It didn't have to be a lot, but you had to have the frequency of gold. And if you had the frequency of gold, then it would, they can alchemize the lead so that the lead would vibrate at a higher and higher frequency and so the lead actually became gold. So all we need is a, a tiny bit of faith a tiny bit of spiritual practice, a tiny bit of intention, a tiny bit of having dominion over our attention, just a tiny bit of gratitude. You can take just a little bit of gratitude every single day and alchemize your entire life. You can actually change the leaden, stagnated place in your life into the golden hue of possibility by spiritual alchemy, having just a little bit. This is why we teach often you know, just just look for something to be grateful for. It doesn't matter what it is. You can be grateful that you have a breath. You can be grateful that you woke up this morning. You can be grateful that someone gave you a compliment. It doesn't matter. But if you start with something like that, you can basically transform your whole perception, which will generate different thought forms, which will generate different experience. And you've become a master alchemist of your own soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to talk. I want to. Well, woohoo! <laughs> I want to go from there. I mean, w- what you're talking about is uh, both you and I have traveled a little bit, and we've gone to hotels where they go and they charge our hotel key, and now we can take that key and put it in the door and unlock it. When we have certainly an act of gratitude or an experience of gratitude, but when we have a spiritual awakening, and I would argue that everybody has an experience that they can't explain. We have explained it all away, and we've said, we poo-pooed it and said, that's not real, that's not true. But what that is was a frequency that was charged on your hotel key by the universe that then you can go plug in and open up the doors to possibility. That is your hotel key. That is the hotel key of the alchemist, all based on the frequency. If we come back to that frequency, it unlocks the doors. Absolutely. We are vibrational beings. And through spiritual practice, through gratitude, through kindness, through generosity, all of these particular attributes of of the spirit, that vibration is radiating and the, the universal presence through universal law matches that vibration. And as you say, you're like stepping on an automatic door. You know, when you go to a supermarket and you step in front of that particular sensor, the door just opens. You, that becomes your frequency and your vibration. As you've indicated, whether it's going into your hotel room, the door automatically opens because there's a vibrational match from the universal presence through its sacred laws and doors open. And you don't have to know how. No one, we don't have to know how that door is opening. The electrician knows. Those that put that together know. If you stand in front of it, bam, the door opens. We don't have to know how that works. We just have to make sure our vibration is high enough 
so that the door opens everywhere we go. And then we say, oh, my God, that was a coincidence that I met that person at that time, which is the right person that I needed to meet at that particular time for my particular project. Or that was so serendipitous for me to walk into that room and see that individual that I needed to see or whatever the case may be. No, your vibration was matched by the law and it had to happen. There could be no other way. It had to happen because you were in alignment with the fundamental harmony of the universe, which is always broadcasting its energy everywhere. But as you indicated, are we receiving that broadcast or are we receiving the broadcast of the world of fear and doubt and worry? It, I love that you use the word harmony in there. We are all in this magnificent symphony. We're in this giant orchestra. We're getting ready, ready to play our own instrument. Let's say that it's a violin. And somebody's doing a virtuoso in front of us. And it, we're not playing yet. But if we paid attention, we would see that our strings are starting to vibrate. Our strings, the music is coming out of our violin and we haven't even begun to play it. The question is... And, and speaking for myself, I, I have twin titanium femurs, twin titanium hips. I'm a dousing rod. I am vibrating. We are all vibrating. The question is, are you putting on noise-canceling headphones? Or worse, as you're saying, you're putting on headphones of the news, the negative worthless stimulation of your, your social media, of fear, fear, fear. Or are you taking it off and bathing in that harmony? Getting in vibration, letting it carry you up, the note up higher and higher, higher still. And then with all the love that is in your heart, playing your music, your note, your harmony with the world. And that's what we're called to do. That's what, we become tuning forks, vibrating at the higher frequency, and then we notice that other individuals uh, start to vibrate at our same frequency, and if they cannot handle it or if it disturbs them too much, then they may not want to be in our presence at that particular moment, and we end up radiating individuals that are ready to go to that frequency. And so the, the, the vibration within us drives people away or draws people people to us or drive, drive circumstances away or draw circumstances to us based on the vibrational tuning fork aspect of life. So we take full responsibility for our own vibration. We don't look outside of ourselves to, for someone else to make us happy. We generate that from within ourselves. And then we, we go out into the world in it, but not of it. We're of the higher frequency. And vibrationally, we change the world as we become the tuning forks. Excuse me, not just the tuning forks, we become the clearing houses for the lower frequencies that become transmuted in our presence. We are that powerful. Woohoo! Now what you're talking about is mysticism. Now I have a school of mystics. I define a mystic as someone who's living on both sides of the veil at all times. So like you're saying, walking on the earth but not stuck in the earth. We are, as, as you're calling it, a clearinghouse. We are an amplifier of that higher vibration. So if somebody comes to you, I imagine, I'm just going to kind of put words in your mouth and you're going to clarify for me. And they say, I can't believe this problem going on in the world today. I can't believe I'm focused on the problem. I'm focused on the problem. I'm focused on the problem. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? You would probably turn to them and say, it's an energy game. People don't understand that there's a difference between the world and the earth. They're not synonymous. The earth is mother earth, Gaia, three-fourths water, mountain ranges, rainforests, rivers, lakes, dirt, and she's alive. And then there's the world. The world is the condensation of agreements, of opinions, points of view, thoughts, perceptions, positionalities that people have agreed upon, and then that becomes a worldview and an, an, an experience for many people. So. We can be in that world, but we be of the higher frequency. So it becomes, and so we live in the higher frequency and we're not, and we're not caught up in the condensation of thought forms called the world. We see it's just the, it's just the, con, it's the con condensation of energy. It's this energy slowed down and now that energy is called experience. And then you hear about it on the news. This happened. 
This disease is taking place. There's these people are uh, there's there's this happening in the world. There's this happening in the world. It's the condensation of an agreement of lack, limitation, and scarcity that is not real. And when I mean real, I mean it is not eternal. It is a temporary condensation of thought forms. We can live in a higher frequency. Walk on the mother. Walk on Mother Earth. We're Earthlings. Walk on Earth. And we can actually live in a different world. We can actually live in a world of harmony and of peace and of love and generosity, goodwill. We can live in that world right now, even as we're witnessing the world of appearances that many people are living in without judgment. But we don't have to live in that world. We can live in the higher frequency and become game changers. We can become world weavers. We can actually weave a different world as this higher frequency moves through us. So this just came to me, Michael. When you judge it, you congeal it. When you love it, you weave it and set it free. You got it. That's beautiful right there. Because if you're judging it, you're creating a resistance, which is making it, as you're indicating, you're congealing it even more. But if you, if you witness it with compassion, Compassion is a high form of love. Compassion, love, compassion is the understanding of the lack of understanding. So you can actually look at something with compassion and you can understand without judging that someone may not really understand their role on the planet. They may, they may not understand that they're, they have tremendous power. They may feel powerless. They may feel less than. You have compassion without judgment. And if you have that kind of compassion, your vibration is helping free people from their limited point of view of themselves and the possibilities that are all around them. Woohoo! What you're talking about, this is, this is so powerful. And the compassion to me is, is twofold. First off, you become this light that has compassion for everyone and everything around you without judgment. You see something, you go, oh my God, you are now, you are sending, I send love, I send compassion, and you are helping to raise them up and to heal them, which helps raise the vibration. Now we're going to a whole new octave of humanity as a symphony, as the whole. But then you also hopefully remember, I want to say, remember, dear one, to have compassion first and most foremost with yourself for all that you've been through. Absolutely. You know, I was I was interesting. You bring that up um, a few years ago. I was I was in meditation and I was lifted. And these these like spiritual beings were around me and they were teaching me and they were sharing with me that I need to a little bit be a little bit more compassionate. That was a little shocking to me because I I kind of hold myself as a compassionate being. And they took me to these through these eight boxes and these different scenarios in my life. And I was looking at these different scenarios. And when I got to the last box, I got it. I could see where I was hard on myself, hypercritical of myself in these particular scenarios in my life. And they went on to say that because I was hard on myself, then I also didn't have the full compassion for others. And something just went off in me and said, oh my God. And I, then I, I, I had this tremendous compassion on Michael in these different scenarios in his life, which birthed more compassion for others. So exactly what you're saying, when we have compassion on ourself or other versions of ourself in our human history, then that energy is liberated for love and kindness and generosity that has been congealed in hypercritical nature. It's liberating. Compassion for ourselves is, is liberating energy, that we have more energy, more youth. We, we regenerate, we renew, because the energy is not stagnant in, in, in ways that bring us down. The compassion is liberating us to a higher note. And without the compassion, I'm going to speak for myself and my life and my childhood, such criticality in me or your critical nature inside of me that is a flat note that's being played now everybody today even if we don't realize and remember who we are we can see and spot so incredibly easy when something is out of vibrational alignment and so if i'm saying i'm love i'm kindness and inside of me i'm hearing bum, bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> someone can catch that 
but I like what you said, we can spot that within ourselves. And oftentimes when we look at things that are triggering us in the world, it's actually a vibration with something that we have not uh, healed in our own life. And so we can, we can, we turn the perception set of out there, we turn it in here. We observe it and witness it without judgment. And then if we witness it without judgment, with the intention to grow, intention to unfold, then that stagnant, coagulated energy speeds up and goes to a higher frequency. And we are now participating in our own self-healing. But it begins with non-judgmental awareness and an intention to become the next great vision and version of ourself, not judging anyone else. I, w- I want to dive into the soil, and I get lots of images coming to me when I'm doing this. And so, and so I'm seeing somebody, I'm seeing somebody going off of a diving board, but they're diving onto a trampoline. They've gone down, but it's actually to bring them up even higher. So this judgment inside of us, these pains, these wounds, these hurts inside of us are all actually here as part of the trampoline mechanism to bring us to a higher level if we don't stay in that lie, aren't they? Absolutely. You observe the lie. You can, if you actually look at a wound or a hurt or a trauma or, or a chronic drama in our life, and if you really observe it and listen, you can hear the lie that's being said. Oftentimes it comes up as an excuse. You know, uh, it'll be, you know, well, this person did something to me, therefore I'll never be successful or I'm not worthy. I'm not worth it. You'll hear a lie. And once you look at that lie, and, and without, again, not judging it, just looking at the lie, you will see that you're telling yourself a lie that has become emotionally charged. So it's become, of your, it's become a part of your emotional content. So it becomes chronic and it becomes on a loop of a record, you know, like those old vinyl thing, p- records that would s- skip and keep going back and playing it over and over and over again. So that emotional charge becomes like the vinyl that keeps skipping. You keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. But if you look at the lie and you say, oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, they did this to me. Oh, it's their fault. You look at the lie and you look at it and you start to replace it with a truth. I'm more than enough. I'm the image and likeness of the source. All of my needs are met. And you you say it to yourself frequently until there becomes a feeling tone with it. And then that feeling tone begins to have its own loop within you. And then through spiritual practice, you're able to sustain the feeling tone. And as I've said over 40 years, you know, the feeling then provides the healing because the because we live in a feeling universe. And then you've come out of that skipping going back, back, back. And now you're again liberating energy and your life experience begins to change from glory to a greater glory, from better to better to better, all because it's an inside job. We're doing the work here inside you. I call it work play because we're playing. It's an experiment. We're playing. We're playing and, 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 and we're playing with high vibes, you see. I, I, and I like that. And I like the word work play because it's something that I've played with. There we go. In, in my different schools and classes that I teach, I don't like to give home work because every word has an energy behind it. And that word work doesn't usually feel liberating on its own. So I like that you put work and play together. So I want to go to the highest level of you, to your higher dimensional being self, to your higher self on the other side of the veil. What does it mean to be loyal to your soul? Each and every one of us are gifted. Each and every one of us has obviously infinite potential. On a soul level, we are multidimensional beings and we can access anything we need to know at any particular moment by uh, recollecting that energy. It's called recollection. I, 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 and so there's a difference between memory and recollection. Memory happens from the brain. Recollection happens from the soul. To be loyal to the soul means that you're not going to leave this incarnation without the activation of the potential that is within you. You're not going to fall prey to the fears and doubts of the worry and worry of the world. You're going to be loyal to your soul so that to the best of your ability without judging yourself every single day. 
You're doing some kind of practice, some kind of acknowledgement of yourself as an invisible, immortal being. Now, not in the sweet by and by, but now, so that you're walking in immortality now. You're walking as an eternal being now. So that the dust and the grit of the world, you become like a Teflon being. It can't touch you because you're living as an immortal, eternal being now, you see. So that's partially what it means to be loyal to your soul. Many people have become loyal to things that they've heard about growing up. They become loyal to superstition. They become loyal uh, to things they've learned in past religions. They become loyal to what their parents have said to them about money or about, about what to be afraid of in the world. No, you are to be loyal to the truth that you are an eternal and an immortal being now to walk in that frequency, break all previous vows of which you have been handholding with mediocrity and take a new vow with excellence and walk in that frequency every single day. And when you fall, you get back up. You fall, you get back up. You fall, you get back up until you are known to yourself as one who keeps getting back up. How do we, Michael, how do we remember then who we are on a day-to-day, on a moment-to-moment basis in a world that is designed to bring us to a state of amnesia, I believe, to be the trampoline to help launch us up? Absolutely. I love that trampoline uh, analogy. I use the analogy of a slingshot. And that is when you have a slingshot and you pull, obviously you pull it back and it creates tension. And then whatever you're shooting shoots really, really fast. So when negativity is happening and we live in an eternal presence of love, beauty, abundance, joy, all all of that is existing right now in the fullness. So when it appears as though we're being pushed down, it actually serves as a tension, like a slingshot to go forward even faster. But with what? with our intention. We have to have intention. And then with intention, that which appears to be negative or a loss shoots us forward even faster into abundance, into, into real living. So how do, we, how do we remember? The key word is practice. We practice what we say we believe until we have insight. And I'll break down insight. And then after we have insight, practice stabilizes the insight. We continue to practice, and then that insight becomes an embodiment, and we continue to practice, and then an insight becomes a way of living. So it's not just a one and done. We actually live our life as spiritual practitioners. So what is an insight? An insight is an event that takes place in our consciousness where we suddenly or incrementally know something that we formerly believed. So belief makes us practice. And then practice gives us an insight. Insight, as we continue to practice, gives us embodiment. We embody it. And then with embodiment, we discover we're living a certain way of life. Let me just break down consciousness for just a moment because we use the word a lot. The analogy that I've used over the years is this. We have ocean. Whether, whether you call it the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, doesn't matter. There's the ocean. The ocean is water. Then there's content in the ocean. There's seaweed, there's algae, there's human pollution, there's boats, there's fish. But the ocean is not its content. There's content and then there's ocean. We're pure consciousness. Then there's content. There's pollution. There's values. There's interpretation of past experiences. All of that is content, but it's not consciousness. When we practice we begin to be aware that we are not the content floating through. We are the awareness observing everything. Awakening, I define awakening, are those moments where you incrementally or suddenly see that you're not the content. You are the consciousness. So when we have an insight, suddenly we know something that we formerly believed in our consciousness, you see. You had an experience years ago or you kept on going out of your body, coming back in, going out of your body, coming back into fear, going out of your body, going, Michael, what are you afraid of? Coming back into fear. This sounds like exactly what you're describing. Absolutely. That was um, years ago. I think what you're, what you're talking about is the first time I was invited to speak publicly. 
and um, an individual. And I, I, I had a, a, a an experience at Big Bear where I was alone meditating, and a scroll came out of the sky. And the scroll actually said Michael Beckwith to speak at this particular spiritual community, and then it rolled up and disappeared. I wrote about it in my journal, and I kept my meditation practice. When I got home, this individual named Bill called me, and he says, we want you to come speak at our church. Now, at that particular time, I, I did not have a license as a spiritual therapist. I had not graduated uh, from the School of Higher Consciousness as a minister. I was just an individual who just loved the presence. It was more real to me than anything. And so he said, would you come speak? We don't, we don't have a teacher right now. And I said, well, do you, are you aware I have no license to do this? And he said, yes, we know that, but we saw you at a spiritual uh, conference. We really liked your vibration. Will you come speak? I said, yes. And as soon as I hung up the phone, I got extremely nervous because I had never done anything like this before. All I had done at that time, people would just come to me on one-on-ones and elicit healings and things like that. So I got really nervous, Michael. I laid down on, the, on my couch. I can see the green couch right now. And I was so nervous. I said, oh, my God, I got to call Bill back and tell him I'm going to have the flu that day. I, can't, I, don't, I don't know how to do this. And so then I left my body. And I was flying, I was soaring. And I could look back at Michael, and I could see Michael on the couch. And Michael was nervous, but I was full of confidence and divine knowing. And the next moment, I was back in the body again, nervous. Oh my God, what am I gonna say? How am I gonna do this? Boom. Then I was out of the body, and I was soaring. And I looked back, and I looked at Michael, and I said, oh man, Michael does, he doesn't, why is he feeling this way? He doesn't understand yet that, and the moment I said the word that, I was back in the body and I was nervous again. Subsequently, I flew up to Tacoma, Washington. And when I began to speak, the energy was flowing through me. People started crying in the audience. People were giving testimony of healings and things of that particular nature. And there was just an, an awareness that there was me that was body identified. And then there was me that was out of the body identified. Now, Michael, let's, let's fast forward. That was in, you know when that was? That was 1970, 78 going into 79. That's how long ago it was. So fast forward, 1987. I'm in my office, second floor, second avenue. That's where Agape was at that time. I, I founded Agape in 1986. So this was the second year of Agape. Something, I was concerned about something. And so I do what I do. I meditate when I'm concerned. I just, so I'm sitting in meditation. And then suddenly I'm standing looking at Michael meditate. And I say, he doesn't have anything to be concerned about. I'm with him. And then I blended back in with Michael. And I had the answer to whatever was disturbing me. Now, the difference between those two scenarios. In 1978, I was more identified with Michael on the couch. Michael had these spiritual breakthroughs and he would go into these transcended awarenesses, but I was still more identified with body Michael. 1987, I had become more identified with the higher aspect of Michael. And then of course, 97, 2000, I mean, as years go on, more and more identified with the higher frequency of Michael. That's called transformation and integration. We actually become transformed and then we integrate through spiritual practice with the higher frequencies. So they're not one and done. It's not like, oh, 10 years ago, I had this great experience, but it's gone now. No, no. When you have, and you alluded to this earlier, when you have these insights, you're to integrate with them through spiritual practice. So they're not gone. They're actually a part of you. And you find yourself as another vision, another version, a higher frequency of yourself than you used to be. Transformation and integration is real. It is not airy-fairy, it's not wishful thinking, it's, it's, it's real. You actually become a greater version of yourself that's already within you. The acorn does become an oak tree. The avocado seed does become an avocado tree. The rose bush seed does become a rose bush garden. We have infinite potential within us. And with spiritual practice and intentionality, we become 
who we already are, you see. Woohoo! <laughs> a lot of energy today. It, practice and intentionality. I, I uh, on my wife's birthday this past year, I was riding my bicycle and I got mwah, kissed by an SUV, you could say. <laughs> it gave me a few titanium parts because who couldn't use more titanium parts? And, and um, I woke up in the ambulance in a state of prayer in a state of meditation, in a state of gratitude. I didn't wake up, poor me, woe is me. I was actually doing the practice. That's what this is all about. The more you do the practice, the more you go to a higher level, which means these problems we're facing, problems, I'll put it quote. Actually, let's ask this. What's behind, Michael? What's behind every problem that we have? If you examine the word problem, it comes from the word emblem. So a problem is emblematic of a state of consciousness or content of consciousness that's been outpictured individually or outpictured as a societal agreement, whether it's a depression, a recession, disease, whatever the case may be. So a problem is simply a visible emblem of a coagulated thought form. So when we examine a problem and we find the emblematic thought form, we can actually dissect it and transmute it with spiritual practice. God, if you want to use that word, the source, doesn't solve problems. But within the frequency of the source, problems dissolve. They're not solved. They are dissolved because they don't exist in ultimate reality. They're simply the condensation of a point of view. So when you go to a higher frequency, they dissolve. Suddenly, oh my God, my back was against the wall. There is no wall. <laughs> I was at my wits end. No, I wasn't. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an instrument of infinite intelligence. Now, everything that I'm saying is not every fairy stuff. It's stuff that, you know, I've experienced in my own life. Things in my own life where, where it appears as though my back was against the wall. But then through practice, the answer that was always there showed up in a language and in a way that I could understand and act upon. And if it's true for me, if it's true for you, it's true for everyone that's listening. We're not like, we're unique, but we're not special. <laughs> Thank you, which brings up an important question, which is what is a disempowering versus an empowering question or a powerful question because what you're saying is ask the right questions you're gonna get the right answers absolutely this is like the the hallmark of the life visioning process the universal law answers any question that you ask and many people inadvertently unconsciously ask disempowering questions they ask what's wrong they ask who's to blame Things that they ask, why me? These are disempowering questions. If you ask what's wrong, then your mind will go on a hunt for everything that's wrong. If you ask who's to blame, your mind will project onto other people blame. You'll project onto yourself shame, guilt, things of that particular nature. And the universe will just give it to you. You, you, you want to know the answer to this question? It'll just keep giving you that debris. But if you ask an empowering question, what gift is here for me to accept and to reveal? What is seeking to emerge through me right now? Why am I here? If you shift the question, the universe will answer that question as well. It'll show you gifts and powers that are ready to be unleashed through you. It will begin to show opportunities that previously you could not even see because your mind was focused on the problem. Your mind was focused on issues. Your, your mind was focused on what's wrong. If you shift from a disempowering question to a self-empowering question, your point of view will change. Your perceptual windows will become clear and you'll begin to see differently. As the statement goes, as thou seest, so thou beest. You start to see differently, you start to, your vibration will be lifted up and you'll be empowered by the eternal broadcast that's saying in substance, let there be life, let there be love, let there be beauty, let there be light everywhere. 
you start to see differently. You start to think differently. You start to act differently. You start to act as an empowered being. And then that vibrational match will match that frequency. An answer will show up. A way will show up out of what appears to your limited perception out of no way. That's the law. Which means frequency, vibration, feeling, what feels good, what feels great, what feels God. That's your soul speaking to you, isn't it? That's it. And that is a part of being loyal to your soul. Many people are being loyal to the news. They're being, they're being loyal to the newscaster that's simply a reporter. You know, I say this, two kind of reporters. There are individuals who are reporting from the old paradigm, and there are individuals who are reporting for that which, from that which is emerging. The pioneers of the possible, the pioneers of a vision. We are reporting from, from, from what is seeking to happen. The old reporters are reporting the news, which is really the olds of an old paradigm. What are you gonna be loyal to? Your soul, which is saying, I have infinite possibility for you? Or are you gonna be loyal to the newscasters that are casting seeds of doubt and worry and fear and anxiousness and anxiety? It's our choice. I'd rather be loyal to my soul than to the news. Thank you, which means we got to go to genuine, we got to go to genius, we got to go to Dr. Howard Washington Thurman, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. He's, he, he, he had a very powerful statement. He talked about the voice of the genuine within us. Now, please be aware, Dr. Thurman was a mystic, even though he was cloaked in Christian garb. He was a, a Christian theologian, but he transcended Christianity and became ecumenical in terms of embracing all paths to awakening. I met Dr. Thurman. I stayed in Thurman Hall when I attended Morehouse College and had a chance to meet him and feel his frequency and his vibration. But he talked about the fact that there's a voice of the genuine within us. It's the voice of our soul. It's the voice of our spirit. And he went on to say that if you do not listen and follow the voice of the genuine, you'll be dangling on the strings of, uh, as a puppet, and that, that someone else is holding those particular strings. You won't be empowered. You'll be dangling on the strings that someone else is controlling, of which many people are dangling on the strings of the great puppeteer of fear, doubt, worry, materialism, consumerism, war, rumors of wars. The voice of the genuine is heard when you meditate. The voice of the genuine is heard when you practice the life visioning process. The voice of the genuine is heard when you affirmatively pray, not beg and beseech a reluctant deity, but to pray to have a realization of that which is real. The voice of the genuine begins to be heard when you're starting to live a life of service and generosity and kindness and compassion. And then you're no longer dangling on the string that someone else has controlled. You are an instrument of infinite potential exuding through your own soul. You become an empowered being of which everyone, everyone has the capacity to live life at this level. Every being. Woohoo! Which means, <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to ask this. What in the world do fish and climbing trees and one most important question to ask ourselves has to do with anything? <laughs> you got to remind me about the fish. Now, I will say this. There's so much about fish. First of all, a fish doesn't even know it's in water until it's taken out of water. Okay. We are in a field of infinite potential. And many of people are outside of that particular environment in an unconscious way. But when you get back in it, you feel at home. You feel at home. When the fish goes throws it back into water, it feels at home. Now, what, what do you ask me about climbing trees? You, gotta, well, you, you, gotta you have mentioned astutely before that if a fish were to judge herself or a fish were to judge oh. himself, <laughs> you know where I'm going now. If, if the fish were to judge itself by, by an animal that can climb a tree, it would have a lack of self-esteem. But, but it doesn't. A fish is a fish. 
A bird is a bird. They all have distinct ways of participating in reality. But here, listen to who we are. We're the image and likeness of God. Now, most people don't know what that means. They think it means that we look like God. But God is formless. God is invisible to the sensorium. What does that mean? It means that we share a faculty with the source. And that faculty is that we have the capacity to think independent of a condition or a circumstance. We can do that. In other words, when source birthed the cosmos, multidimensional universes, solar systems, over 100 billion solar systems now, since that telescope, that, that, that telescope, that new telescope. James Webb, I believe it is. The Webb telescope, over 100 billion galaxies and counting. When the source created all of that out of, out of what? Not even a grain of sand, out of nothing. And we're made in the image and likeness of source, which means out of nothing, nothing. We don't have to change a condition, a circumstance. We don't, have to, we don't have to change other people. We just have to go within and put our attention on no thing but a spiritual idea. And then out of no thing, we will birth a new universe for ourselves, new possibilities, uh, new regions of infinite good. We're not going to judge ourselves by anyone else because we are not one of 7.5 billion. We are one of one. The spirit, the source never repeats itself. So there's no one else like, like us. So we're incomparable. We can't compare ourselves to anyone. Uniqueness is our superpower. And out of nothing, out of no thing, shoo, we can birth a whole new life. Woohoo! It's interesting. I'm going to have to, my guess is, but before we wrap this up, call you back because you said no thing. And the screen, your screen froze and went blank, Michael. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Is it still blank right it, now? It is still, depending on whether I click the big screen, you're frozen. The small screen, you're blank. I'm not sure which records, but you have frozen. So it doesn't affect our recording in any way, but I am going to call you right now back but but i i love looking at the synchronicity there <laughs> because you talk about it coming out of nothing <laughs> and oh thing and then nothing happened <laughs> what's the importance of asking what's our genius the universe answers every question that you ask and i th each of us are a genius according to our uniqueness not to compare ourselves to anyone else but we all have a gift and a talent and a nuance around our gift and our talent. For some of us, it's holding a high frequency. For some of us, it's holding a high vibration during this time of great transition on the planet. So when we ask about genius, because we're one of one, not one of 7.5 billion, everyone has a genius capacity or, and or more. Genius just simply means that you have focused your attention on your gift so that you've become masterful in it. Everyone has genius capacity. If we ask, what is my genius capacity? What is my gift? What is my talent that I am to reveal on the planet at this time in human history? And we begin to hear, not with ears, but with our awareness. We begin to see, not with eyes, but with our awareness, and then walk in the direction of our genius. We will anchor that energy on the planet at this time in human history, and it will affect the prevailing paradigm and change it. Everyone is a genius. Oftentimes we relegate other people to being genius. Oh, he's a mathematical genius. Oh, she's a musical genius. And we put genius way out there. No, it's here. It's right here. So, Michael, you clearly are a genius and you are living in your genius nature. You are being loyal to your soul. And we're going to double back there in one second. But if I go back in time, I think it was USC, way back, way back when you had a roommate. You're walking around with your roommate. You're converting everybody to atheism. Did you have any idea of where you're going or what you'd be doing or who you'd be today? Absolutely not. not I, I, if somebody would have said to me, at that time, oh, you're going to be a spiritual teacher and you're going to go around the world and you're going to work with the Dalai Lama and you're going to do this and that. I would have laughed. I would have said, get out of here. I'm, 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 I'm agnostic. I'm atheist. I, you know, I did believe there was something like some great uh, order that we were all part of. But in terms of religious God, uh, no. And so me and my friend would go out 
and, and, and basically convert people from Christianity into atheism. And so it was a joke every day. We said, how many did you get, Kenneth? And I got six today. How many did you get, Michael? You know, so we would be in competition. But what happened was I, later on, I transferred to USC. Or well, before I transferred to USC, uh, I was in a meeting. I was a, an activist. And I was sitting in this meeting and I heard someone behind me say, if you were to take over the world tomorrow, would the world be any different? So I looked back to see who said that, but there was no one there. The meeting continued, and then I heard it again, but it was from my inside. I said, if you were to take over the world tomorrow, would the world be any different? So I realized it was coming from within me. And so I looked around the room, and I could see the pathology of the people in the room. This person over here had a big ego. This person was territorial. This person always had to be right. This person was always controlling. And I, and I went around the room and I said, wow, if we were to take over the world, the world wouldn't even be any different, even though we had an ideology about peace and about activism. And so I never went back to that meeting. The next week, Michael, someone in that meeting shot somebody. They got into an argument and somebody was shot. But I wasn't there to be a the whole legal thing that went on. I enrolled subsequently in USC. I was a psychobiology major. My path was med school. And that's when I began to have these spiritual experiences. At the time, I didn't call them spiritual experiences. I thought they were pathological mental aberrations because I was hearing things. I was seeing things. I was leaving my body all the time. And and so the first thing that I did, Michael, was I stopped smoking weed. I said, this has got to be the cannabis Davis. And so I stopped smoking weed, but it, the experience is magnified yeah. until finally it culminated with a, um, a spiritual breakthrough. In a lucid dream, I was stabbed in the heart. The pain was excruciating physically and emotionally. And I died. And when I woke up, I could see that we were surrounded by such beauty. The love was penetrating my being and the path of my life totally changed. I became dedicated, first of all, to finding out what happened to me. And then secondly, to integrate and sustain these higher frequencies of life. And that's when I came back into the mystical teachings of Jesus, came back into the teachings of Buddha, came back into the teachings of ultimately Walter Russell and George Washington Carver and Howard Thurman and all these masterful teachers, Kuan Yin, and, and, and realize regardless of what age, regardless of where these figures were on the planet, they were all teaching the same thing. And, and what's beautiful about our time right now that all of this knowledge is not centralized around one central person in different parts of the world. This knowledge is everywhere. It's on the internet, it's in the library, it's in books. Everyone has access. The only thing that separates people is their practice, you see. Everybody's the same. The only thing that separates people are their habits. And if people ge uh, generate a habit of asking the right question, the habit, studying the right stuff, habit of listening to programs like this, habits of spiritual practice, their habit will transform their life. True, true, true. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Last few things that I want to find out about your podcast and what's coming up. What you're talking about here. You talk about being a participant rather than an anticipant. And what you're talking about is joyful participation. You call it joyful participation in the energy that's flowing. That's right. You've really done your homework good. <laughs> yeah, many years ago, I, I, I coined the phrase anticipant as, 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 as opposed to part, participant. Many people are living their life as an anticipate. They're anticipating something good. There's nothing wrong with that inherently, other than the fact that you're always putting your good in the future. I'm anticipating something to happen in the future. But when you dissolve time and space, which are constructs, time is a mental construct. It doesn't exist um, um, in the absolute. You, and you become a joyful participant, meaning the good that you're seeking, the love, the abundance, it's happening now and you start to participate in it with your feeling nature. And then that dissolves the barrier called time. 
and it starts to manifest and demonstrate in your life now, and you're not living life on the layaway plan. It's like, I'm gonna live a little bit of life today and have more life in the future. No, you're opening yourself up and participating in life now so that it shatters time and, and mi- what your mind would call miracles can happen. A miracle is an instant demonstration of truth, an instant demonstration of what's happening now. It breaks into time. Your life changes for the better. Now. Woo. I'm going back to that meeting you were at. You followed the energy. If we're talking about a deep and abiding loyalty to our soul, we've got to focus on the energy and what feels good no matter what, don't we, Michael? Absolutely. And when we're talking feeling good, we're not just talking, we're not talking pleasure necessarily. Pleasure, you can be, a. some people are addicted to pleasure, but they never tasted bliss. They've never tasted ecstasy. They never tasted real joy. Pleasure is temporary. But joy, ecstasy, and bliss, they are inherent within us. And as we start to open ourselves up spiritually, we start to taste a deep sense of joy, the joy of being, bliss and ecstasy that that has nothing to do with an external circumstance. Pleasure has something, many times, something to do with an external circumstance. I went to a ball game. I had some pleasure. I, I ate something. And it, it gave me, it gave my, my senses pleasure. You know, I had sex. There was some pleasure to that. But joy, ecstasy, and bliss, that's inherent within you. And so when we follow and become loyal to our soul, we start to have bliss hits. We start to have an awareness of a joy that has nothing to do with the world. And then guess what? The world can't take it away because the world didn't give it to you. It's inherent. It comes from you. Thank you. Speaking of empowerment, where can people go to find out more, Michael, to find your new podcast, to find out everything that you have to offer? And then I'm going to ask you about Adapt to Zen after that. Very good. Basically, you can find me at agapelive.com, A-G-A-P-E-L-I-V-E.com. That's the portal to the spiritual community known as Agape International Spiritual Center. You can find me at michaelbbeckwith.com, my personal website, and there you'll see many things I'm involved in, a lot of free content. My, my, my uh, uh, app is there. You can sign up for the app. Also, my Instagram page at michaelbbeckwith, you can find Instagram page where I put something on there every day, something inspirational, video, statements, education, things of that particular nature. And then... I'm in the process of launching my podcast, which is called Take Back Your Mind. You'll be able to find the launch date on both of those websites shortly. I've already done some some interviews with some amazing people. So that will begin probably just in a couple of weeks. Take Back Your Mind from the great hijacking that's taking place right now. Amen. And then what is Adapt-A-Zen? Adapt-A-Zen is uh, there's two products that I have released. One is my superfood greens. People have asked me over the years, Michael, you keep looking younger. You keep having all this great energy. What do you what do? You do? So I always say, well, first of all, I have a meditation practice. I have a spiritual practice that I participate in. I have an exercise program that I do pretty much four to five days a week. And then I try to eat things that are nutritious. And so I I used to have a bunch of products that I would put in my mixer. Um, You know, I had my ashwagandha, I had my rhodiola, I had my maca. I had all of these greens and green powders and things of that particular nature in my oat milk or my almond milk or whatever the case was, along with blueberries and and avocados. I developed what is now known as Adapta Zen. It's my superfood green product. It has 47 different greens, plant, plant, plants, plus ashwagandha, maca, rhodiola, which are adaptogens. It allows your body to um, adapt to, to stress. Prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes in one scoop. And it tastes good. 
Now, the parents love it because they try to get their kids to eat some of this stuff. But the kids don't like it. Kids love this because they can just put it in water and drink it, or you can put it as a part of your smoothie. I also have the vitamin D3, K2, and a bit of MCT oil and olive oil. So the bioavailability is really, really good. You know, take a vitamin D pill. You're taking this as a liquid. So it's not being compromised by your digestive juices. It goes to the bones, creates a great immune response and a good mood response as well. So those two products, you can go to Nutrarise.com, press on Adaptasin and get the product. It's also on Amazon as well. Before we dive into a meditation then, Michael, any last words of wisdom you have for people today? I would like people to know that there aren't special people. They're just people who have specialized. Just as someone who is specialized in learning how to play a piano, they've specialized their attention and their habits to such a degree that they become masterful at playing the piano, the guitar, or whatever the case may be. If you're loyal to your soul and you specialize in doing your spiritual practice and your study, you'll become masterful and you'll be able to play the music of the spheres through your own soul and love and abundance and health and joy and creative genius will unfold. We're not special. We are unique individuals who are specializing in excellence. I dare you guys to specialize in excellence. So then, Michael, would you mind leading us in a meditation along with our meditating rooster here, Ruru, Ruru the guru, that is, mind leading us in a meditation of your choice? Ah, Michael, it'd be my joy to invite everyone to come to a complete stop in this moment. Extract your attention from where you are going after this particular conversation. With every single breath you're taking, remove your attention from where you have come from to be here. Just allow yourself to be right here and right now, right where this breath is. You'll notice as you just for a moment pay attention to the body breathing, that it is impossible to breathe in the future. It's impossible to breathe in the past. That breath is happening presently. And with our attention on the breath for a moment, we're coming into present moment. And with our attention, we have a simultaneous awareness with the breath and with our intention to become a greater vision and version of ourself, our real self. Embrace that intention. Now in this meditative moment, I would like you to, first of all, remember a moment in which you were totally loved and appreciated. A moment in which all of your needs were met and you were safe and secure. You were loved and appreciated. All of your needs were met and you were safe and secure. Any time in your existence from the time you were an infant up to present moment Remember such a moment, totally loved, all needs met, safe and secure. Now, if it's difficult to remember such a moment, allow for your imagination to consider what would it feel like if you were totally loved and appreciated and supported, that all of your needs were met and that you were safe and secure. So whether you're entering this door through imagination or through tapping the mystic cord of memory, it doesn't matter. The body and the mind will not know the difference. You are loved and appreciated. You're feeling that all of your needs are met. 
that's abundance and you're safe and secure. Now give yourself permission to allow this to amplify itself with every breath. With every breath you take, there is a magnification of love, abundance, and security. Feel into this. Every breath, magnification, loved, abundance, security, safety. This is the world you're living in. This is the feeling tone. Now from this vibratory frequency, ask this question. Who am I? Ask, who am I? And without judgment or censorship, begin to be aware that the answer is not coming from a limited personality that was forged by time and experience. It's not coming from ego. The answer and the feeling tone is coming from your higher self. All needs met, love, safety. Who am I? You're asking from the place within you that is feeling totally loved and appreciated, feeling the feel of abundance, safe and security. Who am I in this space? Allow the download to take place. It could be a feeling, it could be an image, a sight, a sound, an insight, a direct knowing of something. Who am I? Light, luminosity, brilliance, intelligence, who am I? Now ask this question, what do I want? I'm, I'm a field of love, I'm a field of abundance, I'm a field of safety, what do I want? What do I want to express? So in this meditative moment, from a real feeling tone of being loved and appreciated, a real feeling tone of transcended abundance, safety, security, we're tapping into our real identity, not the personality that is forged by time, forged by survival, with the magnification of the awareness that our life is indeed the life, the emanation of life itself. Mm. Who am I? What do I want? Let your soul speak in a language and in a way that you can understand. Just a moment of silence as you listen with your entire being. And from this consciousness of sacred silence, this consciousness of solitude, quietude, connection, it is my joy to evoke 
the power and the presence and the love that is everywhere for each being tuning in right now. That divine intelligence and cosmic love, true abundance, wellness and well-being is now reigning supreme as the activity of our individual and our collective awareness that we may anchor on earth an expanded good that is beyond even our imaginal realm. And that this word is now serving as a law of elimination to anything and everything that would hinder, delay, obstruct, or deny the fullness of life from moving through us right now. All of our needs are met. Divine health, wholeness, reign supreme in our life our mind, our body, our mental body, our emotional body is full to overflowing with luminosity. And every single thing is working together for our individual and for our collective good. I feel it in my bones, the tuning forks of my body temple. All of this is happening right now. We feel it in this sacred silence, that which has been evoked. Come with me now into the field of gratitude, which is our altitude and our attitude that now clears the perceptual windows that we can see as we are seen by the cosmos, a field of infinite potential, gratitude, thanksgiving, and full appreciation is the vibration we're putting on. And now we can say everything is working together for our good, for in the field of receptive gratitude now. We allow this to be so. Therefore, we can say, and so it is. Now, so be it. Be the frequency, be the vibration. Now. Amen. Amen. Welcome to yourself. Woohoo! Mm. This was beautiful, Michael. Mm. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for the opportunity. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, discover your greatness today, and take back your mind. And above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woohoo! So this is the point where I usually tell you where to go, what to click, and all that click, and all that good stuff for the show, and tell you how amazing the interview with Michael Beckwith was, which it was! It was so amazing! Yay! <laughs> but this is my first time having Hanover, 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 at the end of a show. Hanover, Hanover, Hanover. And so I'm distracted by the cuteness, the pure cuteness. <laughs> Oh, by that pure cuteness. To check out the next amazing video, click here. <laughs> Love you guys so, so much. Keep on shining bright. How does it, boop, boop, get any better than this? Boop, boop. How does it get any better than this? <laughs> Love you guys so, so much. Oh, Hanover. Yay. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> You're such a good girl. I love you so much. And the roux is going crazy.